Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of Acts, and today I'll pick up where I left off last time, chapter 23, beginning with verse 12. Now, if you have not seen all the previous studies on Acts, I urge you to watch it from the beginning. All the previous studies are already uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. But today, beginning with chapter 23, verse 12 in the KJV, and when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And uh, they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat, eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Uh, that's verses 12, 13, and 14. Uh, over the years, I've been unsure about who these Jews are. If these are uh, non-converted Jews who are, do not believe in Jesus, who are just the religious Jews uh, filled with the Sanhedrin that have continue to reject Jesus as the Savior Messiah? Or are these Jews part of the, the group of people that are the, the believers uh, in Jesus uh, who are part of the Jerusalem church uh, who um, were mentioned in Acts 15, 1, demanding that Paul not teach uh, that... Uh, uh, in faith alone, but they must tell people that uh, circumcision is required. You can't be saved without circumcision. And um, there's there's many other examples of these um, believers. They're Jews, and they believe in Jesus, and they're from Jerusalem, and they are continuing to uh, denounce Paul and his teaching. Um, this is also uh, cited in uh, in the book of Galatians. Were, and they're referred to as men from James. Um, uh, so this group here, who took an oath to kill Paul, I can't say with certainty whether they are uh, just Jews who hate Paul and Christianity and, and want to kill Paul because uh, he's, he's teaching to, to uh, uh, do not practice Judaism, but uh, or, or are they... Jewish believers in Jesus who are uh, not uh, believing in faith alone, but believe that the Mosaic laws of Judaism must continue to be practiced, including the dietary laws. That was uh, changed when Peter preached to Cornelius, the first Gentile believers. God revealed to Peter then that Gentiles are included. That was shocking news to the Jerusalem church. And that, and that the dietary laws uh, didn't apply anymore. So, uh, and then uh, we've got the question of circumcision being required. Brought, that's brought up in Acts 5, chapter 15. And then uh, the, uh, there's other times where Paul's accused of teaching that, hey, Paul's teaching everybody to not follow the laws of Moses, that to all of Judaism. So, uh, this, there is a, a faction, mainly the, the Jerusalem church, who say they believe in Jesus, but in fact they don't really believe in Jesus for their salvation. They believe that practicing Judaism, circumcision, dietary laws, uh, mosaic laws, uh, temple worship, animal sacrifices, they believe those things are still required for salvation. So there is a... Uh, that's a Basically, they're the lordship salvationists and the, the, the religious uh, uh, zealots that think that following a religion is also required. You cannot be saved simply by trusting Jesus as your savior. 
So uh, if anybody has any insights <coughs> on this particular group who took an oath to kill Paul, or wh which group, how we should classify them, let me know your opinion on that. I'm undecided. I'm going to read these first few verses here in the, in the uh, Amplified, 12, 13, and 14. It says, <coughs> Now, when day came, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath or a curse, saying that they would not, would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 men who formed this plot and swore this oath. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under the solemn oath not to taste anything, neither food nor drink, until we have killed Paul. Um, what I've always found interesting about these people is that they certainly were determined to kill Paul. They were attempting to kill Paul. They failed to kill Paul. And yet we don't hear anything else about them in history, in the Bible, or anything extra biblical that I'm, I'm aware of about these people, what became of them. Uh, if they followed their oath, they must have starved to death. Uh, and uh, without food or water, they said they would not eat food or drink water, anything, until they had killed Paul. Um, there's no record of them dying. Uh, there's no... They certainly didn't kill Paul, so they must have not kept that oath. Um, if you, again, if you have any insights on these people and what became of them, I'd like to hear that. Back to the KJV, verse 15. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring, da bring him down, that's Paul, bring Paul down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or even he come near, are ready to kill him. See, they hate Paul so much that they want to kill him. But Paul has been uh, threatened with death and attempts on his life uh, now for his entire ministry. Uh, from the very time he, um, he made public that he was no longer going to be persecuting the Christians, but he's joined them. He is a Christian. He's a believer in Jesus. From that moment, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish people were hostile against him and wanted to kill him. At one time, he was actually stoned and left for dead. Um, so, this is nothing new. The attempts on Paul's life, the people being determined to kill him... Uh, let me read a little further here. Uh, so it, the, the plot, the details of the plot are being uh, laid out here. Verse 16. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So that's interesting. Paul's sister's son, so Paul's nephew, somehow he heard about this plot. And, uh, and he told Paul about it. Verse 17, Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say unto thee. This is also making me recall the importance of um, uh, Luke, uh, who is the, the writer of the book of Acts, also the writer of the, the gospel according to Luke. Um, but, you know, I've said this in the beginning, and I've said probably several times throughout this study, that we must keep in mind that Luke was not only a physician, a uh, traveling companion uh, to, to Paul, with, with Paul, uh, and, and able to record much of this as an eyewitness account. A lot of times he refers to, they did this, and he did that, but many times he says we, uses the word we, because um, that's a um, uh, first person plural, saying that he was part of this. He was uh, 
there. Uh, so therefore, he was an eyewitness. But he was a Luke was a historian uh, and, and a highly uh, respected historian. The way he gave such a detailed account of people, places, times, and all these events. Um, but that's what I'm thinking here because there's there's so much detail uh, in in the way he he's written this. Um, so verse 19. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that thou hast to tell me? So I find it interesting that the, the Roman authorities here are actually very interested in getting all the facts, getting the truth, and learning. And they're not, they're not just ignoring. When Paul says he needs to talk to someone, he, they, they listen to him. When this Paul's nephew says he needs to talk to, to them, he, they, they give him an audience. So they're not just like ignoring him and, and like, oh, I don't get involved in this. I don't have any interest in this. Don't bother me with these problems between the Jews. Uh, now they're actually very interested in, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad that uh, they did um, listen. Verse 20, and he said, the Jews have agreed. This is um, Paul's nephew telling the authorities here, the chief captain. The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. So they're, the Jews are going to tell the chief captain, bring Paul to us, to the council, um, and uh, we have more questions. We need to ask him more questions. So that was the... Uh, the, the purpose that they would ask that Paul be brought to them again. Verse 21, But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie, lie in wait for him of them more than forty men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So, the chief captain, uh, it could be that he's just a, a just man and, you know, doesn't want a law to be broken and, uh, and an innocent person to be murdered. Um, uh, or it could be that he doesn't want this to happen because he would actually be part of it and, and be like the, the, they're playing him for a fool, uh, uh, using him for this uh, this um, murder conspiracy and therefore he would be caught up in it and therefore he, he might be held, held responsible in some way. Uh, don't, let's not forget, Paul is a Roman citizen. So they're taking the, uh, the protecting Paul until he can get a, a proper uh, trial. Uh, they're taking it very, very seriously because Paul is a citizen. So if something did happen to him, while he's under the care of this uh, chief captain, this, um, he's probably very worried that uh, it could come back to him and he, he would suffer consequences if he doesn't you know, keep him safe. Verse 22. So the chief captain then uh, let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. So he's also being very, very secretive and uh, very concerned that, uh, uh, that the fact that he's aware of this plot, this uh, murder conspiracy, uh, that uh, now that he knows about it, he doesn't want anybody to realize that he's on to them. Verse 23, And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea. Well, there's 40 people who took this oath to kill him, so he wants to make sure he has a large force uh, instead of just a guard of, you know, two, say, two centurions. He has, uh, he's taking 200 soldiers to protect Paul. Uh, make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea and horsemen, three score and ten. So 200 soldiers... Horsemen, three score, that's 60, and 10, that's 70. 
So 70 horsemen, 200 soldiers, and spearmen, 200. 200 spearmen at, at the third hour. So you've got 470 to guard Paul. So he is taking taking this very seriously. He's not going to let anything happen to Paul. Verse 24, And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Beast to set Paul on is give him a horse to ride. Uh, and he wrote a letter after this manner. So he's, he's saying that, okay, you protect him and, and uh, bring him to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter after this manner, Claudius Lysias unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. So this is uh, this chief captain is Claudius Lysias, uh, and he sends this letter to Felix because he's sending Paul off to Felix the governor. He's being guarded, and he sends this letter uh, for the governor to to read about you know what's happened, why Paul's there, and why he's under such uh, protection. Verse 27, this man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Not should have been, but the way it's phrased is, you know, he would have been killed if, if I hadn't done protected him. Um, then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law. So this is a Jewish legal matter. and uh, um, Normally they're not going to get too involved in Jews, uh, you know, arguing over their own laws and, and violations, but uh, in this case Paul's a Roman citizen. So he's, I think that's the main reason that they're very, uh, so involved. Uh, whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. So these accusers of Paul, they can... They're free to go to uh, um, the, the, the governor, um, uh, Felix, and they can present their arguments to Felix when Paul's in, in Felix's custody. Uh, I'm going to read that portion in the Amplified and see if there's anything we gain from that. The son of Paul's sister heard of their planned ambush, and he went to the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul, calling in one of the centurions, said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and, stepping aside, began to ask him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court, tomorrow, as if they were going to interrogate him more thoroughly. But do not listen to them, uh, for more than forty of them are lying in wait for him, and they have bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. Even now they are ready, just waiting for your promise. So the commander let the young man leave, instructing him, Do not tell anyone that you have given me this information. Then, summoning two of the centurions, he said, Have two hundred soldiers ready by the third hour of the night, that's 9 p.m., uh, to go as far as Caesarea with 70 horsemen and uh, 200 spearmen, also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And after instructing the centurions, he wrote a letter to this effect, Claudius Lysias to the 
Most excellent Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized as a prisoner by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. When I came upon him with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen, and wanting to know the exact charge that they were making against him, I brought him down to their council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Court, and I discovered that he was accused in regard to questions and issues in their law, but he was under no accusation that would call for the penalty of death or even for imprisonment. Uh, when I was told that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you immediately, also directing his accusers to bring their charges against him before you. All right, I guess there's only a few verses left, so I'll, I'll go ahead and try to finish this chapter up here. Uh, verse 31 in the KJV. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle, an epistle is a letter. The letter, um, of course, in the scriptures we have a lot of letters, a lot of epistles written from Romans through Philemon. Also, this book of Acts, I mentioned that that is actually an epistle. If you read the first few uh, verses, you'll see that it is a, a letter that um, um, uh, Luke has written to a particular person uh, giving this account. So, uh, uh, of course, Paul has many letters or epistles he's written. Romans through Philemon. I think that Hebrews is also written by Paul. And then you've got the, the epistles, the letters written by John and Peter and uh, uh, Jude. And I'm probably forgetting somebody. Okay, so this is, when it says the epistle here, it just means that this is the letter that was written by the, the um, um, Claudius Lysias, the uh, chief captain, the letter that was written to Governor Felix, it's referred to here as an epistle. Um, on the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea, delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him, and when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia, Cilicia, he says, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Okay, that's the end of verse of, of chap, chapter 23. Now there are some footnotes here that I want to look at. Um, um, 23, verse 23, there's a footnote, and it says, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea on the sea, was a coastal city built by Herod the Great. It was an important city, both politically and militarily, and its harbor was the largest on the eastern Mediterranean coast. It was the capital of Judea and the official residence of the prefects and procurators, the governors, appointed by Rome, both Pontius Pilate, prefect from A.D. 26 to 36, and Marcus Antonius Felix, this is the one that we're dealing with now, procurator from A.D. 52 to 60. Again, this is important to see that um, we, we, the timeline, I've mentioned many times, it, uh, when I learned about the timelines and got the real context of how long this book of Acts uh, covers, uh, it was a su surprising to me, and it'd probably be surprising to you. Uh, in the beginning of the book of Acts, we have the first great event was, uh, was Pentecost, where the church are received and they're, they're filled with and sealed with the Holy Spirit. And you have the first believers, because a, a, a Christian is someone who has the Holy Spirit in them. This, that's the scripture says, this is how you define what a Christian is, that you have the Holy Spirit in them. And the way that you get the Holy Spirit in you is by your faith in Jesus. You, you're trusting in what He has done for you. He died for your sins, 
He was raised from the dead as a proof that he is God and Savior and, and that he is the person you're depending on for your salvation. So uh, when a person believes that, they are indwelled and sealed with the Holy Spirit and that first happened at Pentecost. And then from Pentecost, you have a 30-year period in the book of Acts, the first 30 years of church history. And now, right now, we're all the way up to, uh, you know, probably 20, it's more than 20 years, probably 23, 24 years uh, after Pentecost, uh, these events that are happening right now. Um, Uh, then another uh, another footnote, uh, slingers or bowmen, that's the 23-23. Uh, uh, when he talks about the guard, uh, talking about the soldiers uh, that he's having guard him, uh, that footnote talks, says um, there's refers to them as slingers or bowmen. <clears throat> and then uh, Acts 23, 24, uh, Marcus Antonius Felix was appointed by Emperor Claudius and served as procurator from, from 52 to 60 AD. Okay, so we've covered all that. All right, so next time I will um, pick up uh, chapter 24, verse 1, and again, uh, if you just came across this video uh, and you haven't seen the previous videos, I really urge you to go back and watch this series from the beginning. It's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the book of Acts, and uh, it's a very important study to understand the beginnings of the church, and particularly to understand in the very beginning they, the church was wrong about a, a couple of very important things. They, they thought that Salvation was only for the Jews, and they had to be taught that, no, it's for Gentiles, Jews, for the whole world. They were wrong thinking that uh, it was a kind of a sect of Judaism, that they, they would continue practicing Judaism. They still continued to be religious and do religious works, and that uh, all those things factored into a formula for salvation. Faith in Jesus plus following the religious of uh, the, the Judaism religiously, that's the way you got saved. Well, they were wrong about that. They learned later that no, Judaism and religion has to be discarded, and instead they must put their faith entirely in Jesus and put no faith in their religious activities. All right, so um, I'll pick up with chapter 24 next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.